Well, it's a real privilege to be with you here and um, to share a little bit at the European Leadership Forum, to share what um, the team and I in London, we are researchers, we are debaters, we research Islam, and we um, talk with Muslims on a weekly basis. That might be in the homes of Muslims, that might be on the streets of London. Um, a few of us have done degrees, and it's just something that we have dedicated our lives to, to understand Islam, to understand the theology, philosophy, and politics of Islam, and then how that um, it translates into European society and how we can respond as confident evangelical Christians um, in the face of Islam. And the particular topic we're going to look at today, it's a hot topic. It's a hot topic in missions. And you will find across the missionary world, in Bible institutions, um, in co on courses that you can take to learn how to share your faith with Muslims, there's all sorts of interesting opinions about the whole concept of the God of Islam, who is called Allah, and the God of the Bible. And we're going to use his name that he gave of himself in Exodus 3.15 when Moses approached the burning bush and he says, who are you? Tell me more about you. And God responds, I am who I am. I am Yahweh, or if you want to say Jehovah, if that's how you prefer to say it, I am Yahweh, that is my name. I will not give my, um, that is my name to be remembered forever. And he says in Isaiah 42, that is my name. I will not give my glory to another. He also says in Isaiah um, 43, he says, I am Yahweh. I am the only savior of the world. He's clear as day. And so the God of the Bible, the, all the way through, he puts his stake in the ground. He says, I am Yahweh. That is my name. I will not give my glory to another. And it's um, said almost about 7,000 times in the Old Testament, about 6,823 times, give or take a few. And so it's a very important name to God of the Bible. And of course, we, when we as New Testament Christians, we often refer, we pray to or talk to God as Jesus. We see him in Jesus. And we sometimes forget the importance of the personal name, the name by which every prophet is to call him. If you look at Deuteronomy chapter 18, it says very clearly that every prophet must come in the name of Yahweh. And if they come in the name of another God, they are to be put to death. That's under Mosaic law. That's how important it is in the Old Testament to the God of the Bible. So the name of God is important. The character of God is important. When you look at the Old Testament view of God, you have Yahweh, and then you often have a description of his character. You see that character all the way through the Bible and really seen visually in the life and teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we're going to hit upon a hot topic in missions, and I would suggest, and I think this is not an exaggeration, you potentially could have about 50% of missionaries will come down on one side of the debate and 50% on the other. And it's the debate or whether it's the same God. Is Allah the God of the Quran, the same God as the God that I follow of the Bible? And it's very, very important for us to be clear on this point, because your starting point is very, very important. Now, what we're going to do as we go through the talk today, we're going to look at what Muslims claim about Allah. We're going to look at what Islam teaches about Allah. We're going to look at the biblical view of God, and we're going to do a comparison. One of the easiest ways to understand or to become clear on this topic is to just do a comparison between the Islamic God Allah and the biblical God Yahweh. And notice I'm already using two names as I describe the two gods. So your starting point of religion, of your view of God, influences how you relate to another religion. So if my starting point is that, well, Islam and Christianity are pretty similar, Allah and Yahweh, same God, there's only one God, and it's the same God, but Islam just got a little bit confused on some of the ideas there. If your starting point means that you come together and you think there's similarities between the two religions, or you believe that the two religions are part of the great Abrahamic faiths, how many of you have heard that, the three Abrahamic faiths? And you will hear that Christianity, Islam, and Judaism are the three Abrahamic faiths. I would like to put to you today that there are only two Abrahamic faiths, that of Judaism and Christianity, not Islam. And that will become clear as we go through. We can open up to questions at the end if you'd like to talk about that a bit more. 
So a starting point is important, and I want us to just move away from the just specifically the concept of Allah and Yahweh and look at a few other starting points that many of those who are working with Muslims have when it comes to Islam. So let's start with that first little concept that we talked about. If Islam and Christianity are Abrahamic, the tendency will be that you will try to find similarities between the two religions and clear distinctions between the religions will not be made. If, for example, you believe that Islamic terrorism is politically motivated and not theologically, i.e. it's not from the Quran, you may be tempted to say, well, a political solution needs to be found. And you may be tempted to ignore the theology behind Islamic terrorism, as many secular um, uh, governments are trying to do. If, for example, and many Muslims make this claim, you believe that Islam in its true form is peaceful, and you will find many Christians will sign up to this, Part of that's just naivety, not knowing what is actually written in the text. Part of it is a longing to love their Muslim friend, to come alongside and have peace with their Muslim friend. But if you start from the premise that Islam and Christianity are peaceful together, then Islam will not be questioned like Christianity has been questioned. You see, Christianity is free for anyone to question. But suddenly when it comes to Islam, Christians, atheists, Muslims, they don't want to question Islam. So the Christian's remit is we have to begin to do the questioning because Muslims themselves will not do the questioning. So we do the questioning to help them to begin to think through their faith. If, for example, your starting point is that Islam is full, and notice I say the, the religion Islam, you have the religion Islam and you have the people Muslims, very clear distinction. So the Muslims are the people that God died for but the religion Islam is the one that 2 Corinthians 10 verse 5 says very clearly that we um, stand against ev every argument and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. Now, I make no apologies that that is my approach to Islam. I do see it as an argument that has set itself up against the knowledge of the one true God. That will hopefully become clear as why I hold that position as we go through the talk. But let's say if you think Islam itself, the religion, is full of rich cultural heritage, and look at the, the lovely um, food and the honor systems that come out of um, the Asian world, for example, and you um, see its rich history, you will have a romanticized view of this Islam, and you will not hold it accountable, much like Christianity has been held accountable. And then we'll go down to the topic we're looking at now. If the Allah of the Quran, this book here, is the same as the Yehovah or the Yahweh of this book here, the Bible, then if you believe it's the same God, does the Christian have anything to offer the Muslim? Is there any real different message to offer the Muslim? Do we even have to do evangelism if it's the same God? You see, our starting point is quite important in how you grapple with other ideas that are different from the idea you hold to. And for us, that would be the Bible. But there's a lot of confusion when it comes to how we interact with Muslims and how we interact with Islam. Two very different approaches. One is the people, one is the ideology, the religion. In missions, you'll find a lot of missionaries who have studied how to take the gospel to Muslims, missiologists, those who are experts in missions to Muslims. Many of them have um, looked at the, and studied the whole role of human beings. So they've approached Islam looking at it as human beings, looking at anthropology, don't worry about the words. And the questions they're asking is, well, how do we live in harmony? How do we live side by side with Muslims? How do we live at peace with one another? And many people have tended to have a very, what we call, pragmatic approach to Islam, i.e., well, it's quite hard to live side by side with Muslims, so how do we find common ground? How do we find ways to meet them in the middle? And unfortunately, that sometimes carries over into finding common ground theologically. So yes, we can find common ground as human beings. Some of us are single, some of us are married, some of us are mothers, some of us are not, some of us are fathers. Um, we meet together in humanity. But does the Muslim and does the Christian, and should they meet together 
in theology. And that's the important distinction that we need to look at today. But you will find some mission ideas, and some of you may have even heard this when you've been trained in um, courses on how to reach Muslims. There's a strange idea that both those who are within Islam and Christianity, um, you don't actually, when you're reaching to a, into a Muslim's life, you don't need to lead them out of Islam. How many of you have heard this concept? And there's a concept started in America, and it's influenced quite a lot of missions of what they call kingdom circles. And you have the kingdom circle, um, you have a kingdom circle, and that's where we're all getting to. You have the circle of Islam and the circle of Christianity. And in reality, we don't really um, necessarily want to take Muslims completely out of their circle. So let's find another circle where we both meet in the middle, and that's the kingdom circle in the middle. It all gets very confusing and complicated, um, and it's not, it, you begin to not be able to find this idea even in the Bible. And so that starts when your premise is that Allah and Yahweh is the same God, and it leads to syncretism. It leads to a bringing together of the theologies of the two religions. Well, why? Why are some Christians working with Muslims and teaching that we have the same God? Why are they saying, well, it's part of the Abrahamic faith? Well, maybe it's because isn't it easier when we all agree? Isn't it easier if we really did have the same God? That's the idea you hear floating around. Also, there's the idea, well, shouldn't we have religious cohesion? We come together religiously because it's us against the atheistic world. There's that concept as well. We Muslims and Christians, we must work together against the atheist. I'd like to put to us to think through today it's actually the Christians who stand alone. And Islam and atheism are bedfellows. Islam and atheism are two sides of the same coin. Islam and atheism, actually when you look at how, if you implement Islam and atheism into a society, the end result will be totalitarian type governments, i.e. dominant governments that begin to suppress free speech and freedoms of choice. But when you look at Christianity, Christianity lifts and redeems society and sees every human being as precious in the sight of God. The outworking of these ideologies, Islam and atheism, and then Christianity over here, is very, very different. So something at the heart of these ideas, ideologies, are very, very different. Some people want to believe that Islam and Christianity and Allah and Yahweh are the same. Well, let's, because we don't want to cause offense. Let's face it, as Christians, we don't want to cause offense. In fact, 2 Corinthians 10 verse 5 was a very hard verse to discover when I discovered it. And, it, and I'd read the Bible when I was at Bible college, but it wasn't until later when I really sat down and was studying how to share my faith with those who didn't agree with me when I came across this verse, 2 Corinthians 10 verse 5. Now, we all focus on the verses before, which talk about our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against the principalities. The very next verse says, for we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. It's talking about the biblical God there, not just general idea of God, but the biblical God. So we don't want to cause offense, but we do need to challenge according to the Bible. And Christianity in Europe has been um, influenced by a very pluralistic society where all ideas, really, we should hear them all, they're all equal, they should um, all be allowed, and really, who are we to criticize or challenge another ideology? And of course, many of you will have heard this, a lot of um, those who don't sign up to any religious faith, they like to lump all the faiths together. You must have come across that idea where all the faiths are put into one bag as if they're all the same. So there's a lot of confusion among atheists, among Christians, among Muslims. And your Muslim friend and my Muslim friends will always say, Betty, there's one God, he's Allah. <laughs> I say, ah. So they're trying to say that my God also is Allah. So they're coming as well in their mission, missionary influences or their missionary approaches um, that there's one God and that God is Allah. And just very quickly, one other thing that's happened is just as a movement in, the, in missions um, to Muslims is you will find either Muslims imposing Islamic ideas on the Bible text or Christians imposing Christian ideas onto the Quranic text. That's something to be very careful, folks. This is called eisegesis in the technical um, name. We don't want to do that. We don't like it when people manipulate our text. So we need to be careful not to manipulate the Quran, i.e., you can't find the gospel in the Quran. 
but there are missionaries who try to find the gospel in the Quran. You can find verses in the Quran that can get you into good conversations on spiritual matters, but you can't find the gospel in the Quran. Because the whole of the Quran, from beginning to end, if you take its whole message overall, is a direct challenge, and the technical term we use is polemic, against the Christian scriptures if you take the whole of the theology of the Quran put together. So how do we cut through the confusion of whether it's the same God or how on earth we approach Islam? Or how do we look at it through good biblical evangelical eyes? Well, on our team back in London, we used a, a concept that was coined by our team leader um, called Jay Smith. And he came up with this concept that I think is the most simple concept to understand, which you do not have to have studied Islam. Basically, we call it the book and the man principle or the book and the man methodology, i.e. when you look at the Quran, when you look at Islam, you go to the Quran to know what, it, what, what they believe, and you grow, go to Muhammad to know what to believe about Islam. When you look at the Bible, you go to the Bible to know what to believe of Christianity. And when you look at Christianity, you go to the Bible, and you look at the Lord Jesus Christ, the God who came to us. The book and the man, the book and the man. So for Islam, the Quran, and Muhammad. For, the, for Christianity, the Bible, and specifically the New Testament and the Lord Jesus Christ. It just simplifies everything. Why? Because you will hear every different kind of idea out there and you will not know what on earth to, uh, to accept. So you go back to the book and the man just keeps it very simple. So how do we have clarity between the differences between these two gods? And this is just something I'd like to put to you to think through if you don't um, necessarily sign up to this. Most people teach about the similarities between the theologies of the two gods or the two religions. I want us to think about the differences because we have found that when you look at your differences, evangelism comes easy. When you look at your differences, you see what Islam doesn't have and you do. When you look at your differences, it cuts through all the confusion. But if you're trying to make everything similar, how on earth do you communicate with something that's so similar? So look at the differences. So we're going to look at five areas of difference. And this is a way to really unpack the difference between the biblical and Islamic God. We're going to look at the theology of God which is obviously very important. That's key to this whole topic. <laughs> We're going to look at God's view of humanity. We're going to look at God's view of sin. We're going to look at God's view of salvation. And we're going to look at God's view of eternity. All of which you will find that Islam and Christianity teach very different things. So the concept of, or the theology of God, well, one of the most important concepts in Islam, and those of you who work with Muslims will know this word, it's a word called Tawheed. Tawheed is the Quranic, or not Quranic, it's the Islamic view of the oneness of Allah. Allah is one. How many of you have seen um, pictures of some of the Islamic terrorists, and you'll see them going like this? Because they're making a statement. Allah is one, and that's the God that they are following. But this one God is very different to the triune God of the Bible. So Allah is one, he's indivisible, he cannot, i.e. cannot be separated, it's one entity, it's very simple, but it's also very pagan in its view of God. When you look at the pagan views of God, that you come up with this concept of this oneness of God. He's very distant, he's very separate. He doesn't interact with his creation overall. And when the Muslim says to you, when Jesus died on that cross, and they say, how can that be God dying on the cross? Who's running the universe when Jesus dies on the cross? Your response is, oh, no problem for the triune God, but every problem for the Taweed God. Because Taweed means he cannot divide. He cannot be on earth and in the heavens at the same time. Because he's one entity, he's indivisible. Now, that will take us into huge, complex philosophy and theology, which I don't want to get stuck down into. But just to present, even the concept of God is very different. We have the triune God who can be dying on a cross and reigning the heavens on high because he is the triune God. So just in the concept of God at the very beginning gets very, very different. 
Then what about God's view of humanity? Well, in Islam, you are a slave to your master Allah, who you are to bow down to and worship. So you're a slave to a master. Is that the description of a Christian? The description of a Christian is what? We are a child to a perfect heavenly father. There's an absolute relationship right there. We had a relationship with God at the beginning, and when we go to heaven, we will have a relationship with God face to face. In Islam, there's no concept at the beginning of a relationship with God, and none of the concepts at the end in eternity. More of that in a minute. Well, what about God's view of sin? In Islam, sin is seen as a mistake. Um, you come to earth because this is a test. There's no relationship broken with Allah because you never had a relationship with Allah in the first place. <coughs> Very key point. Hold on to it. We'll investigate that a little bit more in a minute. But the whole of the Bible, sin separated us from the presence of God. And the whole of the Bible is bringing us back into relationship with God. That's the whole point of the Bible, to show us how to come back into relationship with God. Sin has caused division. How many of you have been wounded because of sin against you? How many of you have broken relationships because either you sinned or someone sinned against you? Every single one of us can put a hand up at one point on that. So sin destroys relationship. There's no concept of that when you look at humanity in its relationship with God um, in Islam. There is no relationship with God in Islam. So the whole point of the Bible and the reason for Jesus is all about sin, to bring us back into relationship with God and to worship him. But that leads us on to salvation. What if in Islam, is there a concept of salvation? You know, I ask my Muslim friends, I actually, they, they don't really talk about salvation. It's not really a Muslim concept. It's much more of a Christian concept. But they will sometimes talk about it. And when they do, I'll say to them, what in Islam are you being saved from? Because when you enter into paradise, certainly me speaking as a woman, I will enter paradise and I will watch any man that's in my life, be it my brother, my father, if I get married, my husband, will go off and will be with perpetual heavenly maidens forever. So it looks like sin is entering into the paradise. So we're not even being saved from sin. Sin follows you into paradise. And I'm in a broken relationship because I watch my husband go off with all these heavenly maidens. So what am I, what are we being rescued from? Sin is seen as mistakes, it's not clearly understood because there is no need for a savior in Islam. They have a very unclear view of sin. It's a very important area to discuss with Muslims. But in Christianity, God hates sin because it caused division between him and us and us between each other and the whole of creation is groaning. So we're gonna be redeemed, that's all gonna be redeemed. And if you, if you like, God what came on a rescue mission. That leads us into eternities. I've just hinted at the Islamic eternity. Not only will men have virgins and maidens in heaven, they're either called Hur or Huris or the Azwaj Mutaharatun in Arabic in the Quran. And there's big descriptions about them in the, in the Hadith, the sayings of Muhammad. But there's something missing in the Islamic paradise. What is missing in the Islamic paradise? God is not there. So you do all of your practices in Islam. You are the best Muslim ever. You get to paradise and you never get to God. So not only according to Christian theology do they not get to God because they've rejected the divinity of the Lord Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior who died on the cross for their sins. They've rejected that because the Quran rejects it. But even according to their own theology, they never get to God. That is serious. So if you, your starting point is that we have the same God, folks, you're denying this key difference that Muslims need to know about. They need to know this difference. So they recognize there's something missing in Islam and something fantastic about Christianity, God's message of salvation. And the whole point of the Bible is to get us back into relationship with God, Revelation 21, where God will dwell with his people and he himself will wipe the tears from our eyes. There will be no more pain, no more crying, no more suffering. The old will be taken away and everything will be made new again. That is the promise for everyone who trusts in the Lord Jesus. Now I want to look at a few more reasons why I believe Allah and Yahweh are not the same, 
and also why we do not have three Abrahamic faiths like we introduced near the beginning. Let's look at it historically to begin with. Why there are only two Abrahamic and not three? Why Islam is not part of the Abrahamic faith? Now this goes to an area of very interesting study. You could do a workshop on every single point here, um, but I'm just going to introduce it to you so you're aware of it if you're not already aware of this. The kind of historical critique that has been applied to the Bible for the last 200 years or so, we are now applying to the Quran. We're applying to the life of Muhammad. We are applying to the whole traditional story of Islam. Because you see, when you look at the traditional story of Islam, it makes claims about what happened in history. But when you compare it to history, the archaeological record, documentary record, manuscript evidence and so on, the two are saying two very different things. History says one thing and the traditional story of Islam says another. Whilst if you apply the same questions to the Bible, the Bible stands up strong and is able to answer the critics and can be supported by the historical record. And for those of you who ever come to London, Sarah and I do a tour of, and Hatun at the back there, of the Bible and the British Museum, um, where we look at the documentary manuscript and archeological um, artifacts that support and corroborate the biblical record. So where our Bible stands up, the Quran falls on its face. So we know that all the stories that we have of Muhammad, they were written about 200 years after he died. And we now know, according to what the historical record is showing, that Islam most likely started 60 years after Muhammad's death. That Muhammad might not have had anything to do with the religion of Islam. I'll put that out to you because this is a fantastic new area of studies. It's very, very insightful as to what actually happened at the beginnings of Islam. Then we have a claim by Muslims who say that the Quran is, is perfect, it's never been changed. How many of you have heard this claim? And almost every Muslim around the world will make that claim. The, the difficulty is manuscript evidence shows something different. So we have six earliest manuscripts. They all say they don't agree. They are different and they are different from the Quran you use today. And then um, Hatun and others around the world have found and discovered more than 26 different Arabic Qurans still existing today that don't agree with one another. So the Quran is not perfect and unchanged. It is very different. It has been changed. Now, I want to look a little bit at the concept of, of um, Allah, but also Isa. Where did Allah come from and where did Isa come from? You see, they say Isa is Jesus. That's what everyone believes. And in fact, when you look at the Turkish New Testament, the Arabic New Testament, you'll see Isa um, in there. Certainly in the um, Turkish New Testament, you have Isa in there. And many of Christians, when they refer to this person, Jesus, they refer to Isa. But is Isa Jesus? Very important question. Where did Isa come from? Well, we know in Arabic, the way you say Jesus, or, or let's say Yeshua, God says, very important, God's name is in all of that, Yeshua. The way you say in Arabic is very similar to how you say it in, the, in, in, in Hebrew. Hebrew and Arabic are very similar in that. And we know that the oldest Arabic translation of the New Testament that we have in existence today, it's found in St. Catherine's Monastery in Mount Sinai, it uses the term Yeshua. It does not use Isa. So Yeshua is in Arabic New Testaments 200 years approximately after Muhammad came and died. So where does Isa come from? And why on earth do Christians use Isa today? You see, when you look at Isa, it starts with the Quran. Isa starts with the Quran. It has no historicity. We can't find it before the Quran. Yeshua, we know, was used a few hundred years after the Quran was supposedly written down in the Arabic New Testaments. That's what our earliest record is saying. What's more, when you read the stories of Isa, you don't recognize them. How many of you have read the stories of Abraham, Ibrahim, Musa, Moses, Dawood, David, and so on, Suleiman, Solomon, in the Quran, and thought, oh, I don't recognize these stories? How many of you have read the stories of Isa, thought, oh, I don't recognize these stories, especially the denial of his divinity? <laughs> don't recognize those. You say, where on earth does this come from? Well, you apply source criticism, i.e., Muslims say this came from God. Well, let's look at history and see if that's true. Because the stories that are in here, 
that borrow the names from, from Jewish text is not the same stories. And the stories of Isa you don't find in the Quran. So, but we do know where they came from. And there's, a, um, there's many different sources, but I'll give you just two. So, for example, in Surah 3, verse 49, and chapter 5, 110, um, you have Jesus breathing. He's made a clay bird, and he breathes life into it. We know that this comes from the second century infancy gospel of Thomas. This is heretical writing, most likely Gnostic-type writing. So we find the kinds of stories that are in the Quran begin to come from sources that begin to appear in the second half of the second century, up until about the seventh. Um, take the story of Isa by a palm tree, and suddenly a stream appears and looks after Isa and his mother Mary. We see that in chapter 19 of the Quran and chapter 3, verse 46. We know that this was taken from the sixth century Syriac infancy gospel. So these late Gnostic Gospels, heretical Gospels, that's the source of the stories of Isa in the Quran, not the Bible itself. And these stories deny the divinity of Jesus. These Gnostic Gospels deny who Jesus is. It denies the historical Jesus. It's fascinating when you see it all begin to fit together. And always at the back of your mind, begin to think, oh, same God? Same concept of Jesus, same person, always have these questions at the back of your mind. So we know that the Isa, who they claim is Jesus, comes from his, um, heretical sources that are in the Quran. And we also know that the Quranic Isa denies his divinity. That means it's not the same person of the Bible. It's not the same God. Because Jesus is God manifest clearly to us. That all of the divinity dwelt within him. When you, if you know Jesus, you know the Father. And yet the Quran denies this. Well, what about Allah? The Islamic name for God or the God. Maybe it was general name of God. But we do know the name Allah existed um, around the time when the Quran was being compiled. We do know that it existed in paganism. And now all the geographical evidence and archaeological record is pointing to the fact that Islam most likely didn't start with a man called Muhammad when he died at 632, but it started 60 years later, most likely. That's where the evidence is pointing to. There's no mention of, a name, of the name Islam or Muslims in the first 60 years of, of Islam, according to Islamic tradition. As an Islamic tradition says, Muhammad died and then Islam was in play. But that's not what the historical record is saying. It all starts 60 years later. That's when the, uh, the manuscripts begin. And that's when maybe some of these titles and names of Islam begin, where the statement of faith, the shahada that a Muslim has to say, there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his messenger, that starts 60 years later after Muhammad's death. But we know Allah was a Nabataean God from the, from the area of Jordan, Petra, Jordan. How many of you have been to Petra? Love to go to Petra. That potentially is where Islam started. When you go to Petra, there was a Nabataean God um, called Allah. He had a wife um, um, called Allah, Mrs. Allah, and a daughter. And you do find those names in the Quran, by the way. But what's more, this God is a pagan God. And the theory is, it's not been proven yet, but this is where all the evidence is pointing, that potentially it could have been whoever started Islam, their family God. But certainly it looks like it all starts in Nabataean and Petra, Jordan. All of the first mosques, by the way, or most of them, for the first hundred years, all point to Petra, Jordan. That's where it's all pointing to. More of that another day. So Allah... Even the name comes from Nabataean paganism, not Abrahamic. The Abrahamic God clearly puts his stake in the ground and says, I am Yahweh, that is my name. I will not give my glory to another. Isaiah 62, uh, 42 and 43. Now, biblical reasons why um, Islam is not Abrahamic. We're going to the starting point that begins to lead people to think that and there's more similarities than there really is. Hebrews 1, 1 to 3 does not allow folks for another Abrahamic religion. 
Hebrews 1, 1 to 3 says, Clear as day, God used to speak through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But now he speaks through the Son. Clear as day. When my dear Muslim friends say to me, Betty, why do you reject Muhammad? I just recite. I just tell them Hebrews 1, 1 to 3. Because the Bible says so. I can't accept Muhammad. He speaks through the Son. And if God himself has entered time and space to walk and talk with us. Why don't everybody go back to prophets again? You don't need prophets. All the prophets point to the Lord Jesus. So the Bible doesn't allow for an Abrahamic religion, plus the Bible shows that it's through Isaac's line that the nations are going to be blessed. Go to Galatians 4 verse 30, very important verse, where it says, have nothing to do with the slave woman, Hagar, and her son. See, everything spiritually is to do with Sarah and her son, Isaac, through which is the prophetic line. So even the New Testament supports what the Old Testament say about the, the promised child that comes through Isaac's line. So let's move on to something else before we begin to wrap up. You have heard of the six beliefs of Islam. Those who work with Muslims will hopefully be able to rattle them off. You have God, you have prophets, you have books. Could we just close the door? Um, God, prophets, books, spirits, predestination, which is fatalism. So those of you who are Calvinistic, it's still not quite the same. Take it one step further. It's fatalism. Um, um, predestin um, uh, fatalism, I don't even want to say predestination. I want to call it fatalism. And then judgment, judgment day. Same words or similar words, complete different meanings. And all of it connected to a God who is your master, not your heavenly father who loves you. God who is a tyrant, actually, when you look at the Quranic view and the character of this God in the Quran. So to wrap up, yes, there are same names in the Quran as in the Bible. Yes, there are same beliefs that you and I may sign up to. For example, we all believe in God. We are so do Muslims. We believe in, we, we accept that there were prophets. That's how God spoke in the past. So do Muslims. But the concept of prophethood is very different. We believe in books, but that's very different. They go to books that you and I don't recognize. They go to the Quran that really replaces the theology of the Bible, especially when it comes to the concept of God. And then they go to the sayings of Muhammad, which is called the Hadith. They go to um, the biography of Muhammad, which is called the Sirah. They go to the Tafsir, which are the exegetes or the interpretations of the Quran. They go to the Tariq, which is the histories of Islam. And they go to the Sharia law, which is the law of Islam. Do you see how complicated it is? It becomes very, very complex. There's a lot of contradictory material within those different genres of literature. And whilst the Quran says to go back to the Bible, it actually, the Quran disregards what the Bible says about God and how God has entered time and space and engaged with humanity to rescue us. And probably one of the key verses to use to show the key difference between the biblical and Islamic God is this. If you go to Genesis chapter 3, verse 8 and 9, and this is a, a little key verse that we use in our team in London because I think I use this almost every time I speak with a Muslim, almost. You start with Genesis um, 3, verse 8 and 9. And at the beginning of the, the Bible, it says, God walked and talked with Adam and Eve. Then what I find helpful to do is I go through right, right through the Old Testament, right into the New, show all the times that God walked and talked with human beings where he met with Gideon, where he met with Abraham at the tents of Mamre, where he met um, Samson's mother twice and father, where he met with, um, with Hagar, where he met with all these people through the Bible face to face. Exodus 33 verse 11, for God would meet with Moses. He spoke with Moses face to face as a friend speaks with a friend. And he certainly did that for 33 years when the whole of the New Testament and then Revelation 21. He will live with us. He will dwell with us. It reflects back to Genesis 3, verse 8 and 9. He will walk with us. He will talk with us. That's the key difference between the Islamic God 
and the biblical God. The Islamic God takes all of that away, including the promise that we're going to walk and talk with them, talk with God. So it's our differences that help us make evangelism with Muslims easier. Because then we have something to offer. We have a different message, a different concept of God. So just to wrap up, if there's nothing else you remember from this whole talk, remember this little tagline um, that a missionary who was um, from West Africa once said when I was hearing him speak, and it, and it really sums it all up. And he says this, and we'll wrap up with this, and then we'll open it up for questions. On every foundational truth of the gospel, the good news of Jesus who enters our world to rescue us and bring us back into relationship with him, on every point of the gospel, Islam teaches the opposite. So if you remember nothing else, on every point of the gospel, Islam teaches the opposite.